<laughs> I don't actually have a webcam on this computer, but I'm going to switch to YouTube shortly. Give people a couple minutes to roll in late. Sorry, I want you to get a good day. Hello. Mm. Mm, it's So should I try to make myself look more presentable for this, John? I feel like it's probably a little late, but <laughs> your life. Abby, are you still on campus? Or is that your room at home? This is actually my brother's room at home. Oh, OK. Yeah. But I'm not at campus anyway, because I'm student teaching on campus. Oh, right. Connor is also a teacher. Oh, awesome. I mean, what do you teach? Uh, physics. Oh, very I'm not, cool. Not teaching right now. <laughs> yeah. Are you guys going online at all? No, right they, they never organized anything. So now okay. we can't do anything. So these kids are going to be out of school for more than a month. Oh, my gosh. Wow. So that'll wow. be fun for everybody. Do you teach in State College or where are you at? Uh, town outside of Boston. Oh, okay. Very cool. I rode with Connor at Penn State um, when I was in 2013, 2012, 2013, 2014-ish. Yeah, you're okay. a year older than me, so it would have been 2011 to 2014. Yeah. Okay, it's 7 o'clock. We might as well get started on time. Um, thank you, everyone, for roll it, joining. I'm sure a couple people will roll in a few minutes late, but what else is new? Um, just to sort of reiterate what I said, let's just um, think about there's a lot of people with a lot of levels of coaching experience here. So let's try and be conscious of that when asking questions or listening. Um, I think it won't be an issue that there's NCAA club and scholastic coaches participating because I'm the one going over film and it's going to be my collegiate athletes. Um, and yeah, that's really all I wanted to say. Um, I would, it'd be probably good if everyone had a um, pencil and paper with them. Um, just shout out if you want to come back to something later. Just ask me for the timestamp and the video. Uh, I don't know how seems, to read. Oh, shoot. <laughs> um, that seems like a good way of going back and forth between, um, or going back, going back to something in the future. Um, unless someone has a better idea, in which case I'm open to that. Um, okay, so let me pull up these videos. Also, we put it in the chat bar. What's that? Uh, this is Becky Robinson, and I would suggest if we have something, we just put it in the chat bar. Um, you can open up the chat, and then we can timestamp and just put it right there, and everyone can see it in terms of a question or going back to. Yeah, uh, that seems good. Okay, um, so I have a couple, couple videos and I'm gonna fire them up right now. Let's see, how do I do this? Share, okay, oh. Okay, so um, this is our Penn State men's novice eight over at the beginning of spring break. Um, we have a couple guys with prior experience in the boat. Um, we have a couple guys with, you know, who started rowing at Penn State who are generally freshmen. Um, and this is, I believe, us doing two minute pieces with Ithaca. Um, so I'm just going to, it's a short video. 
going to talk about, going to watch it first. I wish I had the rate that they were at, but I don't. Okay, so I do not want to watch that right now. <coughs> All right, so we're going back to the beginning. Um, I'm just going to start, start from the beginning. Um, so I'm using the period and comma keys on the YouTube to make sure that we all, we can go frame by frame. So one thing that we're starting off with that I think is we're all like, we're all squared up here. You know, it looks at least on um, port side, we're all squared up. Our, ha our blade heights aren't level. Um, six seats carrying his hands a little high. Um, but we're all squared up and we're all moving towards the water at the same time. Um, and I think that looks pretty good. Now here we can see that even though we all started moving towards the water at the same time, um, stroke seat and two seat were able to just put their blades in the water a little bit faster. Um, and our guy in four seat, just not, not quite as quick to the water. Um, but I do like the timing on how we're all moving together. Um, now we're just sort of progressing through the drive and I guess to sort of go full screen here. Um, what I sort of am looking at one thing that I see that I don't really like is we just, we're not getting, this is a novice crew, but we've got a lot of rounding going on here, sitting up straight. The body angles aren't really super consistent, um, which I don't think is great. Um, but I do like, you know, the timing into the water. And for the most part, we, you know, we have those body angles and there's a mishmash of body angles, which isn't great, but we're in the water. We're driving together. Now we can see here that there's, can I? Um, we can see, you know, stroke seat's got his knees almost all the way down while seven seat, just not, not with him. Um, and you can sort of see most people have their knees mostly down, if not all the way down. I think it's hard because stroke seat's wearing black leggings. But, um, you know, we, we got the blades to the water at the same time, not quite in the water at the same time, but generally moving pretty well. So now we're just progressing through the drive. And we're just, you can see that, I'm gonna go back a couple frames. Like stroke seat here, his blades come in more diagonally out of the water than I would sort of like to see. Like his, he's sort of, he's got maybe six or eight inches left to draw in the arms a little bit more. Um, and the blades come in horizontal, like diagonally out of the water. He's not pulling in, getting a clean tap down. Um, and we're sort of seeing, like now we have two seat who's, you know, feathering right now and then six seats still square coming out of the water stroke seats feather almost on the feather here so the timing isn't isn't quite together there but we are exiting we're all finishing the stroke at the same time it's just we're not all finishing the stroke in the water together which is sort of less than ideal for obvious reasons um, so now, I wish the resolution were higher, but we see six, can you see my mouse on the screen? Yeah. Okay. Six seats just, he's slumping his head down a little bit. He does this on the erg too. Um, this sort of, n none of these kids believe me when I tell them that you can form bad habits on the erg that transfer over to the water. And I'm trying, I'm really trying, but. We're still working. It's a work in progress. I'd say it's a work in progress, but we're not on the water right now, nor is anybody anywhere. So let's see. I'm going, all right, going back to the finish here. Now, a lot of people, some people call it the release. Um, some people call it the finish. I think there's good reasons for both. Um, I've just, I'm a creature of habit. When I was taught to row, it was the finish. So it's still the finish to me. 
but we're all so we're not quite getting the bodies over at the same time here um you know six and seven leaning back a little bit stroke seat sort of sitting upright you can tell he's swinging the body already and i think that and like we can see you can kind of see that seven seats outside arms still a little bent we're not we haven't gotten the hands away completely yet but we're getting there. So we're not. Uh, I can't see that. Can't do that. There we go. So we're all squaring up. We're squared up pretty much together here. I think bow four is a little late. But once again, we're moving to the water. Stroke seats missing, 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 missing. There isn't quite the clean placement, but there is. You know, we're all entering the water more or less together. So I think that's pretty good. Um, pause. So I'm just going through this next stroke. Two seat, you know, uh, stroke seat's not not starting to feather yet. Six seat is, four seat is, bow seat isn't. So we're just the timing's not there. Um, one thing that I did with one of my crews that I would call to sort of help with this um, is just tap down, square feather, square again, um, just so we're doing that in sequence together, right as we tap down, right as we get the blade out of the water. Um, I still don't have a great drill or set of ideas to do about this beyond just yelling at people to square up earlier, um, which I do on a pretty regular basis. Um, my personal school of thought is that I just, I would rather see people square up earlier and then learn to delay it a little bit than get used to squaring up too late and flip catching. Um, and if it's, it, it's probably less than ideal at how early they're squaring up but that's my own personal school of thought with these novices. So here we can see six seat, four seat. Um, I think six seat and four seat are my two experienced guys. So that looks like pretty good blade entry to me. Nice bit of backsplash. Um, I think you can see a little bit in two seat. I think his back's already opened up a little bit, but he's gotten the blade in at a good time. And stroke seat, just not so much. Again, we're just going through the strokes. This one, the timing looks better. It's just the, I like, I, a lot of my guys, I like how early they start the roll up, but they don't all finish it at the same time. So I try and give them just sort of like landmarks, you know, when the, be finished, when you're, be finished squaring up, when you are over the, over your feet, when you're over the uh, stern stay of the rigger, just, you know, think about sort of mechanical landmarks. Um, and I think that helps them sometimes when they remember. Yeah, again, we have six seat carrying his hands pretty high off the water here. Okay, I'm gonna go to another video. This is my men's no this is a men's novice four. Um, and John, quick question. Yes. Um, just like with the general format, are you do you want to go through a whole bunch of video to begin with? Uh, and then are we like circ I know you said to make notes and circle back. Um, but like uh, the even with your emails and stuff, I'm just curious what what you wanted sort of the general format to be. Like do we want to like kind of look at stuff and discuss it or is it kind of to look at a whole package of what's going on for you with your program and then like next time we do a call it's another program or something like that um you know what i'm open to ideas i was thinking just to, like go over a bunch of stuff and then like circle back to it but if you want to just like ask questions as we're going and you think that's a better way to do things um let's try it let's see how it works well, I, don't, I mean the only the only curious thing that i've had that's like i think interesting is like 
and I, and I think this happens when like you you get to, you watch this video with like a ton of backstory you know what yeah. I mean? like yeah, yeah, you not yeah. only have this practice in mind when you took the footage and all that but on top of that yeah yeah you you also have a you have the whole season behind these guys you know and I, I found at times like the people that I'm really hard on because like maybe I thought that they weren't making a change that I thought they could like connotation with which how I like talk about them and view it shapes it so it's it's an interesting thing yeah uh, no, you're right like, um but that's just like as as I see that boat for the first time I mean I don't know it, it's just interesting because you have such a deeper history and you're telling us that the ones in each seat it's actually kind of a really interesting practice I feel like in and of itself I don't want to keep talking but that's just an initial takeaway from this yeah this is I mean just sort of this I was I, I was hoping for someone to volunteer to sort of talk the next session lead the next session um but yeah this the whole the full, whole format is up for debate so is up for you know interpretation debate if so if you have if anyone has feedback please let me know um i want to make this worthwhile for everyone participating cool how okay. many videos do you have john like i was going to go through this one and then just sort of go back to the q a type all right, why don't we watch this one and then we can, you know, kind of go back and forth between this one and the first one. Okay. Yeah. So we'll just watch this one and I'll, I'll talk like for a minute about it. I'll set a timer. So you can tell that this is like a way more experienced crew. I don't know. Maybe I can tell because I know these guys, like you're saying, I have all the backstory. like we're squaring up together a lot more. Blades are moving quickly to the water. Uh, the timing's not great. You can see port side's already in, but starboard side's moving to the water together. Yeah. You can see the arms and three seat are like totally straight. He's still hanging on it. Um, stroke seat's almost all the way in. And we're not quite out of the water at the same time, but. Oh, okay. Yeah, you want to circle back to the first video? Yeah, let's do uh, it. Ask me some questions. How much? How much release work have you guys done at this point? I mean, I mean, at this point, we were, I think, two or three days into spring break. Oh, I can look at that. Yeah, we were three days into spring our spring training trip. So we had about six practices on the water after our whole winter erg season, which started early November. So very little. We've done very little of anything at this point beyond just sort of rowing. Um, and in general, I'm like, I would say that I don't really have good ideas for what to do for release work. Um, I'm, my, the rowing I was taught is always sort of catch focused and that sort of has created a gap in my knowledge. So what do you think? Uh, <laughs> I guess I'll go. I don't know. Um, well, just... Can you replay this live just like so we can watch it again? Yeah. I mean, they look like a pretty solid novice crew because that's what they are. Yeah. Um, I don't know what everyone else thinks, but I think the most glaring thing for me is at the start of the stroke, right at the catch. I mean, all the shoulder positions, I know my crew struggle with this too, where, you know, that outside shoulder is the one's the one dipping down. So we're not relaxed as we enter into the, into the catch. Like you can see here a little bit. Yeah. I mean, even, yeah. And look at your seven seat too. He's diving three seats diving. Yeah. Um, and then you have to, you have to then pull vertically 
instead of horizontally in order to start moving the boat. And that's not what we want. We want it to be in, relaxed, drive through. Yeah. Do you have any, what else to have any what do you, how do you, how do you get your crews to, I don't know. Is it just, is there something you can think about or is it something you can work on on the erg or is it something you just I have mean, to can, yell at people about? Yeah, you can do, you can do any of that stuff on the erg or on the, on the water. I, I do do reverse pick every day for a reason. It's to really think about that rotation around the pin versus lunging for more length. Um, I have something I, that works with my crews, um, yeah. is, uh, you know, I have them, I have them like just sit in the boat and I have them sit up really tall and then like relax and then sit up really tall and then relax. And when I feel like they're totally relaxed, I say, all right, now just slightly drop your inside shoulder and like, and then they feel like this little seat, that, you know, on their on their torso, like, they'll be like, I can't see it in my clothing, but they'll form yeah. like a very slight C. Um, when they get in that position, I say, now notice how your inside shoulder is just slightly lower than your outside shoulder. And you want to just continue to maintain that on your way to the catch. Um, and so I'm always, I'm always focusing on that for them when I start to see them get all tense up and try to reach for more you know, length by dropping that outside shoulder, you know, I remind them to like press the shoulder, press their inside shoulder down towards their hip. So that those are some of the phrases I use when I'm coaching them. Um, so we do that stationary thing where they get them first just sort of centered and relaxed and then have them just slightly drop their inside shoulder. And then when they're rowing, I tell them to just sort of press their inside shoulder down towards their hip. Press towards, I like that. And it, yeah. And actually, it results in two things. One, it helps them, you know, angle their shoulders parallel to the oar shaft so that their inside shoulders down. Um, but two, but when you when you press your shoulders down, you're activating your lats, um, and so that when you drop the catch, you're you're connected. Your shoulders can can sort of mm -hmm. you're connected better. Yeah, I like that. You know, one kind of connected to that, but uh, a quarantine thing. I haven't done yoga in ages, and I've been doing a little bit of yoga now because I'm quarantined again. And just an interesting cue that one of the classes I was doing online told me to do with Warrior Two was to actually put my hips in the opposite direction of, of what I thought I wanted. You know, Warrior Two, I'm like trying to make myself in a sort of flat line. Sorry, Tom. You know, flat line going this way. Can't really see. But so I was always trying to level out my hips the same way as my torso. And a cue was actually to drive my outside hip forward. And then it had me reset with my shoulders to twist. And it was just interesting because then all of a sudden I could twist better and understand it better just because I had sort of isolated the movement uh, to my torso a little bit more as a result of not, not making my whole body do one thing and of more kind of segmenting it out. I like that. Yeah. Um, one thing is also just not trying to do too much. So many novice crews <clears throat> are trying to do everything at once. And uh, Becky was saying that, you know, they're getting compressed and then they're going for more. Uh, if you go up to the catch, John, you skip towards the catch. I don't, Becky, why don't you take this one over if you want, since you're the one who looked this off first. Okay, so I'm unmuted now. So one of the things that I do is when I see something, okay, in this instance, it was the lunge, I always look one step backwards in the stroke because you can work on that item or ask yourself, is it coming from something they're doing prior to that? Because everything has something that comes before it. So one of the things I spend a lot of time on and I look at is the relationship to the compression or the shins in a video and actually putting the blade into the water. And what I would like to see is as, as they get to full compression, so perpendicular slightly past, the blade is being buried. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't know if you can do that slow-mo so we can look at them. So they're burying the blade and driving right now. Yeah. 
So if either go forward or rewind, it doesn't matter. This is one quarter playback speed. Yeah. So that as they're coming forward, what I'd like to see is the catch there. Yeah. So, right. And what happens is, is that the recovery can help you put the blade in. And so when they get to the point where they're compressed and their, their bodies have, their shins or their slide has to stop because they can't go further, then they have to put the blade in somehow with movement and they reach with the upper body. Mm -hmm. So how do you fix it? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's ways, but yeah. So like I would spend more time fixing this on working on the recovery than I would per se working on the catch. Because the recovery is setting up the catch. That's what I believe. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, yeah, what do you... When you talk about working on the recovery, are you talking about sequencing, timing, posture? Uh, no, I'm working. I would, uh, like, like, if I wanted to attack that, right, yeah. I would work on set-ins from half slide. That would be okay. the first place I would start. But, I mean, that would be a drill I would pick. So that I would just have them sit at half slide and basically get them to square up. And I want to get that, I want to slow that timing down so that they have time to get the blade ready. Yeah. Just sort of let them think it through a little bit. Right. I mean, pausing at half slide would do it, but not until they felt it, right? Like, yeah. like you could pause at half slide and you could still get that, but um, set-ins from half slide. The other thing when I watch this run at this speed is, and this was one of my big focuses in Georgia for my one full week of coaching was getting them to recognize that when they square the blade, they also drop the handle. So during the square up plot process, the blades move away from the water simply because the inboard hand and the position of the inboard mm -hmm. hand drops. Becky, that reminds, I mean, I haven't applied it to sweep as I'm predominantly coaching sculling, but I think the same would work. But uh, a thing that somebody like popularized talking about on a team I was on a bit ago is making sure like people think about this for squaring. And whether you're thinking about it or not, it has that downward motion to it. And uh, the talk that people were trying to switch it to is square, roll your knuckles to the shoreline instead of rolling your knuckles down to the water, you know? And then it also kind of increases length around the arc, but I, I totally agree, yeah. So a lot of our kids skull in the fall and actually, so when you're sculling and you get to the point where your hands uncross, one of the things that we teach is slightly pressing the left handle down and lifting the right handle up. So level your hands before you lift both. I actually was working on them with that so that as they were squaring up, they were also simultaneously with the outboard hand compensating for that drop. And I agree with you. I talk about, you know, like an undercut, like punching, like rolling and punching and pressing the hand out. Like you're going to hit somebody under their chin. That, that the knuckles don't go down. You would not punch somebody with the back of your hand. So I agree with you. And I think the sculling analogy is great because you don't want them to, like they, you can see it in sculling when they do it with the wrists and then the blades go up. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. No, that makes sense. I mean, this, this is a really loose stitching of something Becky said with something Connor said to begin with. But I mean, Becky like went to a point that I was, if you're, you know, if you're trying to work on their preparation and just getting the blade in, you might have to make the stroke shorter. And this is going back to the release comment and how to work on releases. Like with the novice crew, it probably doesn't make a load of sense to do like delayed feather or something like really articulate where you come out square and then feather away. I mean, 
that might be too much, but I think the, the simplest thing is you can't have a release without a drive. And so some ways I think the easiest way to work on releases is by making the drive simpler, you know, and IE that would just mean like, you know, legs only rather than it being about isolating the legs or getting on the legs, it, you could also just see it as like a simpler stroke. And then maybe that gives them a chance to like be more meticulous with their release timing together and stuff like that. Um, but that was just one thought I had, like the easiest way to work on the release, you have to have a drive, but make the drive simpler. Yeah, no, really that makes too. sense. Yeah, to add on to that, um, I think what Becky was saying, Becky, is a set-in just catch placement? Yes. Okay. So so. I do some set-ins and I do some, like I'll do a one-stroke pull through off of it and then a three-stroke pull through off of it. But yeah, a placement. Yeah, so what I do, one drill that I love is sitting at, depending whether it's, I think with a novice crew like this, I'd probably just start at arms and bodies over and just working on that whole legs approach as you approach the catch. And, you know, doing it just on the square, catch placement, making sure that they're putting it in as they're still moving forward versus wait, 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 slam the hands up, and then they get the blade in finally. Like, it should, they should be able to feel that bottom edge of the blade actually enter the water, get some backsplash on it. And then I switch over to doing it on a feather and just slap the water. And then you do it squaring down to the water and then you do square down the water, then pull through and just kind of gradually working your way up to the complete stroke as you go in working off of those initial catch placement set-ins, whatever we're calling them today. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a generally a big fan of just building up, um, building up to, you know, building, obviously building up to what I want to say. But I think that starting earlier, like Becky was saying, starting earlier, like if we are having, you know, release issues, you know, you, you start on the, you start earlier in the recovery. You think about getting together earlier in the recovery, you know, doing pause work doing cat placement drills, stuff like that earlier in the recovery to bring things together. Uh, we, we had uh, this guy who kind of a, really drove me crazy, um, coached the Crassbury Sculling Camps. Uh, he's from New Zealand. And between the accent and some of his accolades, he had a pretty big chest about him. But he said down, down in New Zealand, the only way that they do set-ins or placement drills is always from bodies over he claimed so literally all that was done so arms are prepared body is prepared and that all that's left is the slide it's sort of interesting and sometimes it's a little hard for an athlete to figure out like the extraction from this that position or to have the blade flat but at the same time i've done it with my athletes some because i really like the element that all it is all that's left is a slide they're already like kind of gathered and organized to an extreme that's just another thought that came to me yeah, I like, I personally also, I mean, I guess I can see where he's coming from. I actually got this from Connor, but I like doing pa pauses at arms and bodies over. Um, it just makes people, th in my own coaching, I have found that my, I am not great at coaching, just getting reach forward f from the hips, like from pivoting the hips, pivoting the torso into this turn. Um, I find my athletes just sit up a lot taller than they probably should. Um, and I think that just thinking about if you can isolate the legs only on the recovery, I, that's another great reason to do the arms and body pause on the recovery. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to mention that you were saying, you know, you weren't sure about how to work the release or because you, you kind of rode, your, your rowing upbringing was catch, catch focused. Um, but continuing on what Becky said of work the step right before it, you know, if you work the drive, you know, if a lot of your guys, or not a lot of your guys, some of your guys are pulling into their laps, right? Which is yeah. why their their blades are rowing out of the water. So if you do some feet out rowing and, and uh, you have to set it up right though, because, you know, you can, you can get by in feet out rowing and cheat and not get the benefit of it. Um, so, so you really got to set it up well, I, I, I feel like. And so when I always feel like I have to give this big speech to my guys before we do feet out rowing, 
so they make sure that they're not cheating. So they make sure they get the full benefit from the drill. And what I tell them is, is, you know, I really need them to have a lot of courage and to be really brave in the drill because, you know, the only way they're going to get benefit out of it is if they're brave and they've got to really hang on as long as possible before cutting their finish. And they've got to make that arm squeeze actually effective. They can't just sort of let the boat speed carry the blade through the water, right? Because if they do that, they're going to end up just having their handle drift backwards and they're going to, they're going to fall backwards. So instead they've actually got to try to increase the boat speed by staying connected in the arm pull. Um, and, and they have to be really brave while they're doing that. And in order to do that, in order to stay connected in the arm pull, obviously they can't pull down into their lap. They've got to pull in a little higher. Um, you know, and I, I, I've, I've done feed out, you know, for a couple of years now. And the first time I learned my lesson, by not really giving them the big speech beforehand, you know, and uh, and I saw some of them hooking their feet, you know, underneath the rigor, sort of to hold them in place, or you know, doing a, other kind of crutchy, cheating things, um, and just thinking they were doing doing the drill right. Um, but if I if I set them up with this big speech about how I really need them to be brave here, really brave, really hang on as long as possible. Um, I found they really tried and were able to keep their, you know, their blades buried, at least during the drill. <laughs> I don't know if it always translated into rowing by all eight after that, but. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. Yeah, sometimes it's, it, may, it makes a lot of sense to, oh, in, in the moment, you just like, all right, let's do this drill. Um, like this is what you're physically going to do. But I think the mental prep aspect for some drills is that's, that's good. I like that. I can go back to this. Let's go back to this because <clears throat> video, why not? Um, yeah. So my like my personal favorite drill that I do uh, too frequently probably um, like I said my rowing upbringing as it were was really catch focused slap drill like Connor was saying where we're coming up into the catch and trying to hear a pair or four or six or eight or whatever you know slap the water at the same time hit the water at the same time approach the water at the same time um, well, because of your, you're approaching the water at the same time. Um, so that's something I really try and get, get my athletes to work on. And that's something that we, you can kind of sort of work on, on the ergs, I think. Um, just if you're, everyone's arguing next to each other or whatever, just making sure that you're cat, you're pulling on the handle at the same time out of the catch. But yeah. Anyone have any other? Yeah, there's. Is it, what's going on? One second. John, just uh, I think a broad um, thing watching all these videos is, um, you know, I, I think you it's tough finding a balance with novices because you need to get them up to speed and you need to get them feathering, you need to get them racing. Uh, but I think also just, you know, being able to go back during the week at some point, even during season and just have them do some hard pulling uh, on the square uh, would help them certainly uh, with the finish, keeping that air pocket behind um, the back part of the blade. Uh, and keeping that all the way to release so they're coming out clean and that also just gives them shape around the finish um, so that blades aren't clinging to water uh, through their recovery because then as as people talk about diving into the catch and stuff like that you know as uh, you know that blade stays tight to the water then you're forced to move your handle heights uh, you know to set the blade in on the square um, by squaring up and adjusting and changing your handle heights there so I think you know, when I was coaching novices, I think, you know, that's something I always struggled with was, you know, uh, 
I think to get them engaged in the sport, you've got to, uh, you know, kind of get them going all eight uh, pretty quickly. So they, they realize kind of the payoff and, and what you're trying to do in the end. But then I, I think looking back, I would have wished I would have found ways, um, you know, to, to slow things down and, um, you know, keep stuff on the square. And I think one way to do that is to, to try it, especially when you're in the spring season and they do know how to pull pretty hard, is just getting, you know, a little bit of add a pair, uh, you know, with some pressure uh, or, or stuff where they can, you know, work on square blades and, um, and, and you know, work on a squ- uh, stable platform and, uh, you know, help solve some of their, their own issues just by, uh, just by pulling hard. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I really like the phrase you use, the shape around the finish. Um, I think that I can't tell you why I think it makes a ton of sense, but I think it makes a ton of sense. Just thinking about like you're moving the handle, right? You're tracing a shape. You just got to You got to think about it. I really, I, I really like that. Um, yeah, no, I think that's, that's good. I may, think that makes sense, especially about, I, I don't know to what extent my novices are the air pocket would make sense until they felt it. Is that something that you find that like people don't know what you're talking about when you talk about keeping the air pocket trapped behind the blade until they feel it? Or is that something that you find a lot of your crews get sort of intuitively? Uh, I think that's something where uh, if you're having them, um, you know, with, with a, a little bit of pressure, it doesn't need to be nuts. Uh, but especially if you can break it down and have them go by pairs and actually watch their blade, they will quickly see, you know, that you are creating space when you pull uh, on the drive, uh, that you are creating space between uh, the backside of the blade and the water uh, between that. So I, I think it's something that, sure, it needs to be explained, but I think it, it can be pretty easily grasped uh, if they do a little bit of watching uh, of their blade, especially uh, by pairs when they've got a heavy load uh, and they're accelerating the boat. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I like that. Uh, yeah, thanks, Phil. One thing on the square blades thing, too, that we found really helpful with our program, and we're almost exclusively doubles and super small boats, so it's a little bit different because they have a lot more control over set. But um, we we do a lot of square blades, and at first when it's really challenging and they're trying to get, like, how to make the square blades thing work, Um, I'll have them do a pause of arms and body and feather like the first half of the stroke. And then when they get to arms and body, they square up and they do the rest of the recovery on the square, which can occasionally lead to some serious rushing when they're like really unset. Um, But for the most part, it gives them that like stability that they need. And then they still get the benefit of a catch on the square that's truly on the square without having to go half boat or make the sacrifice of super wobbly. Yeah, that makes sense just sort of finding that compromise between rowing on the square and letting them feather for stability. Uh, Yeah, no, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, Has anyone else used the sort of air pocket communication? Is that? I use that quite often when you're just talking about, you know, especially at the release where you want to pull through and make that air pocket and you want to slip that blade out in the air pocket before you uh, start washing out and start throwing water. You want a nice clean release and you want to create that. I don't care what level of rubber you're at. You need to be opening that up. Nice. Yeah. That makes sense. Cool. Um, Yeah. So this is the video I had prepared. Um, I think we did a, had some nice, Got some nice feedback on it. Some nice thoughts were shared. Um, Does anyone have a problem with me uploading this this recording to YouTube? No? Okay, cool. Um, I think it just could be good reference for myself in the future. Um, Yeah, so it's been, um, does anyone else have any final thoughts, final questions? Well, one thing as we watch this crew, I mean, again, John, you're privy to like, you know, the ergs in each boat, you know, the horsepower, you know, the amount they've been rowing and stuff where, uh, you know, we're seeing it, most of us for the first time. 
And I mean, like the, I, I'm trying to search like between the two. I mean, I still think there's certain stuff like, you know, that you could like, you could really, it's really easy to look at video and be critical, you know, yeah. everybody does that, whether it's yourself or not. So I could totally do that. But knowing what you're telling me, I, I would know out of, you know, right away that obviously like this four has a faster speed because of what you're saying and you being with them. So I'm trying to like purposely look at it with an eye of like, of maybe what, are, what, what do I think these guys are necessarily doing that's knowably better? Hopefully it's not just like horsepower, you know, and strength and, you know, there's still, it is a smaller boat. So set could be more challenging and stuff like that. And the, the front end timing that we were just looking at that kind of Becky took us through on the other one, we just saw there, you can see it pretty easily that still they're kind of, they're, they're pulling up before they're quite ready to go in. But yeah. one thing that I feel like I see is there's a way better organization on the recovery. Like one thing when I try to sit back with my eyes a little too wide to see everything a little bit blurry, to me, it almost looks it, – it looks like the recovery is a little bit more in tune with the movement of the boat. So that's, like, one of the biggest things that I'm looking at to try to find a difference. I'm trying to find in my head, like, reverse engineer the justification why this crew might be, you know, such a, such a better crew. And I feel like that's a difference. The four guys are a little bit more in sync on the recovery, and it just kind of looks a little bit more fluid. You know, if you watch the landscape behind it, I think I can kind of see a recovery that's a little bit more in tune. But I don't know. Yeah. That, where my head's going a little bit. I, I find too with novices, like I'm not sure I know, you know, that there's like a, a base level of like what what are you know when you think about um like the big rocks, the ones that fill up the bottom and then uh, that make the foundation, right? Like I'm not sure I know what fits in the foundation. What are the most important things novices need to know? You know, they need to go back and forth together. They need to get their blades in and out together. But, you know, I tend to focus on, I may be focusing on things that, that may not be important for novices, like um, maybe certain things with their body position. I don't know. And so I wonder if people have thoughts about, you know, what they feel like are sort of, the most important things for novices to learn and kind of the things that are just too, a little bit too advanced for novices to, to try to be grasping at the moment. Just kind yeah. of a generic question. I think that one. for novices, like the first time you get in a boat, um, I feel like speed corresponds to like how strong you're pulling on your blade but like rowing is so much more than just the power that you put during the drive um it's a lot more impactful by your catch timing and your release timing and your recovery and so i think just like making that distinction that um like the power in a boat and the speed from a boat doesn't just come from how hard you're pulling on that blade yeah i would agree with that I, my sort of foundational thing is just putting the blades in the water together. That's sort of where everything comes from for me. I'll add something. I think when the novices start rowing, that they kind of understand they're supposed to row together. But what they don't understand is how to control the slide. And I would spend lots and lots of time when I coach novices trying to get, learn them how to, to have a slow slide and pull harder. And you can work on that in here. You can work on it in the boat. The slide stuff, just do lots of pause drills at different slides or hands and body out. They'll never get the catch down without a slide. Catch is really complicated. So I'm going to answer Chris's question. I would work on the slide over and over and over again. And they'll really never really understand rowing until they have their slide control. And when they first get in the boat in the first month of rowing, slide, slide control makes no sense to them. So that's what you have to work on, I think. Thanks. Over and out. Yeah, to, to add on to that, um, I think that's correct, is just teaching them how to move together. You see how many novice boats have we seen going down in 
May after they've been rowing for almost the whole year that they still can't control their slide together and they, you know, they're getting good power and it's still together, but it's just spinning your wheels, spinning your wheels, spinning your wheels because they never got that first foundational, okay, we need to move together. We also have to move controlled on top of it. And then if you don't learn that and you're novice here, it's just all an uphill battle from there. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I always say that like the biggest thing with novices is to get them to a point of consistency because if they're not doing the same thing over and over again, you can't really start to approach anything. So I always tell mine like the first thing to think about is doing like I don't care if you're making a mistake, do the same thing over and over again because that's something we can address and then focus in on the things they can control, which I would 100% agree is like the ratio. Like they, they have a lot of control over that. They have no idea what's happening with their oar. It's like all of a sudden an extension of their body and that's super overwhelming, but they can control like the actual speed. And so giving them something that they can like tangibly handle without overwhelming them, um, I think is like the, the key. And you can't do that until they're consistent and do the same thing over and over again. And if they feel like all they have to do is be consistent, they're pretty chill and they don't get overwhelmed, at least in my experience. No, it makes sense. Cool. Yeah, I think that's a, some really good points about just where to start with the, I, I like, I think Dan had some really good points just with uh, just consistency, control from Maddie and Dan. Yeah. Um, so I guess we'll, guess we'll wrap it up here. Um, thank you everyone for calling in. Um, I found this to be really helpful, really informational. I hope everyone else did too. Um, I would like to organize another one of these about the same time next week. Um, I would like someone else to volunteer with some film with our crews or a crew film that they like. Um, I'll send out a sort of wrap up email after this session. But um, yeah, thanks for tuning in and hope to see you all on the water sooner rather than later. Thanks, John. Yes. Yeah, John. Thanks, John. Thanks for organizing. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. It was fun. It was fun. Thanks, John.